Welcome to the American Shoulder and Elbow Surgeons podcast. I'm your host, Peter Chalmers, a shoulder and elbow surgeon at the DVC of Utah and Salt Lake City. Before we get started, I should mention the views expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect, reflect the views of the American Shoulder and Elbow Surgeon Society, the University of Utah, the University of Colorado, and the Institute of Center are guests. I'm joined today by my co-host, Rachel Frank. Rachel, how are you? Doing well. Thanks, Pete. How are you today? Oh, I'm doing great. Today, we have a really special episode for you. We've invited one of my personal mentors, Dr. Kenya Maguchi, as a guest. Dr. Maguchi is known to many members of our society, but for those of you who don't know him, Dr. Maguchi began his training at UCLA and George Washington before completing fellowships at Columbia and the Mayo Clinic. He's been at Washington University in St. Louis ever since, where he's completed an additional MBA. He built Washington University's program into a power horse before transitioning to part-time to serve as the chief medical officer for Centene Corporation. Dr. Yamaguchi has made numerous contributions to the field, culminating in the Kappa Delta Award in 2015. Dr. Yamaguchi, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Peter, Rachel. I uh, really appreciate the invite. Well, let's start at the beginning. How did you first become interested in shoulder surgery? Ooh, I'm so old. It might be hard for me to remember. <laughs> um, you know, I've always I've always been a baseball fanatic, and shoulder is a big part of baseball. And I, I always love sports. And uh, but uh, I I think that really what gravitated me towards orthopedics. What really got me to shoulder is I trained at George Washington University, and uh, the chairman there was a, a giant in the in the history of shoulder surgery. His name was Robert Neviser. Is Robert Neviser, and. Um, Boy, um, it, I just found that joint to be really, really uh, fascinating. Um, back when I was a resident in the dark ages, um, shoulder was just an emerging field. Um, there wasn't a ton known about it. A lot of the uh, innovations and understandings that we have about shoulder treatment were ahead of us, not kind of behind us or with us. So it was really a, a neat opportunity. And uh, I remember when I looked into uh, uh, training for shoulder, there was only a couple training places that were even available. Uh, Columbia, uh, University of Washington, Seattle, um, San Antonio, and a brand new one that hadn't started yet, but was, but was interviewing for fellows for the first time. That was University of Pennsylvania, which went on and become mostly uh, the Jefferson Fellowship. So. That's all that was there. It was really a wide open field, and um, and I I thought one that with a lot of opportunity and uh, and um, uh, mostly it was just just a very interesting uh, area of the body for me. Tell us a little bit more about your fellowship year. What were some highlights and some memorable experiences for you? Uh, well, I, I did my fellowship at Columbia Presbyterian with uh, Lou Biliani, Evan Flato, uh, and um, uh, Roger Pollock, uh, among others. And uh, it was a, uh, a very, very interesting year. It was, it was one where um, I, I learned a ton. Uh, it was a rigorous year, very, very tough year. It was one where the expectations were very, very high. Um, there was there was a lot of work to do, but it was one where you you basically you know you, you put in the hard work and you got a lot out of it, and uh, it was a wonderful foundation for the rest of my career. Um, learned a, a completely different way to think about shoulder surgery, and also thought uh, a, a completely different way to think about just research in general. Um, both Lou Biliani and Evan Flato in particular were uh, uh, wonderful mentors. They've had uh, completely different styles. And uh, so you kind of got a, 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 a great ex experience from the standpoint of variety, um, multiple ways to look at things, multiple ways to, to uh, do things, um, both very effective but different so you know you didn't get just one way of looking at things and, and uh, it, it, it was a fellowship that really started to teach me how to think and at the end of that you went to st louis tell tell us what drew you to st louis and to washington university at that time 
<laughs> uh, well, um, what drew me to St. Louis was uh, a, a bit of desperation. I, I was getting close to the end of my fellowship, in all honesty, and did not have any good job opportunities. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of, you know, shoulder was an emerging specialty. There wasn't a whole lot of people looking to hire a shoulder surgeon. In fact, there was practically none. And all of a sudden, one day I was in, um, I was rounding and I got a page from a 314 number. And, and for those of you who don't know, that's the area code for St. Louis. And I almost didn't answer it because I didn't recognize the area code. And, um, and uh, I thought it, it must have been a missed page. Yeah, but I did answer it and I got on the phone and and all of a sudden I, I, I spoke with an assistant who said, oh, thank you for calling us back, Dr. Yamaguchi. Dr. Gelberman would like to talk to you. And uh, I'll always remember this first conversation because uh, Richard Gelberman was the brand new chair at Washington University in a brand new department of orthopedic surgery. And he just got on the line and he said, uh, Hi, Ken. This is Richard Gelberman. I'm now at Washington University Barnes Hospital in St. Louis, and we're going to be building the number one orthopedic department in the country. Those were pretty much exactly his first words to me. And um, first of all, Dr. Gelberman had been known for a while to be the number one chairman candidate in the country. And uh, I, I didn't even know he went to Washington University. And the fact that he was there really spoke volumes. But um, I, I was certainly in the position of a beggar can't be choosy either. And um, in any case, he said, We'd, we would love to have you come and visit us. And and uh, the next thing you know, I'm, I got a couple of plane tickets for my wife and, and I to come out there and visit St. Louis. And it was just amazing. It was an amazing trip. He talked about his vision for the department and 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 uh, it was it was really compelling. I, I felt like I would be on the on the ground floor, something that was going to become uh, extraordinary, and um, and uh, that's pretty much what happened. I I, uh, I had the good fortune and incredible privilege to actually be the first person he hired for this brand new department of orthopedic surgery at Washington University. So I got to see it from the beginning. Now, you mentioned at that time that shoulder surgery wasn't really even known as a separate subspecialty. How did you then go about, you know, you arrive in a new city, in a brand new department, you've got this chairman with a vision. Tell us then, how, how did you go about building kind of a shoulder, shoulder as a discrete thing? Was that a fight? What, how, what was that process? Well, for, for one thing, believe it or not, I mean, Dr. Gelberman comes to Washington University from... Um, from Harvard, from the Harvard Combined Program, from Mass General, and um, and he's trying to build this brand new department. And the first person he wants to hire is a shoulder specialist, which is you know kind of unheard of back then. Uh, and yet, that's the first person he thought of hiring. He he thought that that was a specific need there. So, convincing the chairman and department that shoulder was a spe separate specialty, and that uh, you know, and that there was a a specific need for that was not really a problem for me. And, uh, and when I got there, I, I actually thought about it uh, a little bit in, in, in my, quote, negotiations for uh, uh, coming to Washington University, I asked him if he would uh, actually um, uh, sponsor me to start at WashU and then immediately leave WashU for the Mayo Clinic to learn elbow with uh, Bernie Mori. I had learned a shoulder at Columbia, which, you know, where literally the book was written with Charles Neer. Uh, and then uh, I thought, gee, if I could go to the Mayo Clinic and, and learn elbow from Bernie Mori, who literally wrote the book for elbow, you know, that would that would really make me unique uh, in starting a separate service. So while the concept of shoulder was 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 emerging and not completely rare. I, at that point, the concept of being a true shoulder and elbow person trained in both joints was super rare. Um, and um, and uh, I thought that would be something that could help put WashU on the map. And so 
um, went to Mayo Clinic and uh, and learned with uh, uh, Dr. Mori for a short period of time. Came back several times afterwards, also with Sean and Driscoll, and that was an extraordinary um, um, uh, situation too. Now I remember when I when I first interviewed with uh, uh, Dr. Gelberman, um, he asked me, you know, where do where did I see myself in the future, and um, and I responded in a way that I, uh, you know, honestly, I was gaming it a little bit based on the way he, he introduced himself on the phone call to me, but I also kind of felt it myself, which was, I said, in, in, in several years, I, 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 uh, I plan on uh, developing a brand new shoulder and elbow service, and it's going to be one of the best in the world. And, um, and he, and he said, well, why, you know, that's a big statement. Why do you think that, that, that you can do that. And I said, well, I trained under Bob Neviser, and then I trained under um, Lou Biliani and, and uh, Evan Flato. And uh, then I'm going to train under Bernie Mori. And, um, and then I'm going to have you as my chairman. And I said, why not me? And I said, that's, a, that's incredible education, incredible resources and, and support. It should be me. We should be able to do that here. And uh, so, it, it, you know, in a large part, I thought I was a, a product of some of these giants before me and was going to be you know, a giant like Dr. Gelman supporting me while I was there. I mean, it's really unbelievable with, with that story in terms of your start there and then everything you've contributed to the field from a clinical and a research perspective. It, it's amazing for me. I know Peter probably already knows this story, but it's amazing for me to hear this story. And I'm sure our listeners are are equally amazed. And one of the things that you've done, you know, at WashU with your career is contribute to the field in so many areas, but in particular with rotator cuff disease. And many of our listeners here on this podcast are trainees. They might be students, residents, fellows, and even faculty in their early careers who are still kind of learning the ropes. For those that are interested in a research career, or at least having research as a part of their career, your story is obviously really illustrative. Tell us what got you interested in that direction once you started at WashU, and, and specifically with the cuff and understanding the natural history of rotator cuff disease. Yeah, um, so there's a couple parts to to that um, answer. So. Number one, you know, I, I, you know, I, I had a theme of differentiating uh, Washington University from other places that were going to be uh, leading places for shoulder and elbow. And um, one of the ways that we were going to differentiate ourselves was was uh, education. Uh, when we started our fellowship, and even before that, when I was part of the Ham Fellowship and for resident training, I just I, I, I knew that there's going to be places that had greater volumes than what I would have and greater experience than what I have and have more of a research machine than what I had. But but I, I thought, hey, it's achievable to be the very best in re educating uh, residents, students, fellows. And uh, and and uh, I thought that would be one differentiator. The second thing was short of short of building the practice. Uh, um, uh, um, presence that takes some years to develop. Um, early on, I, I thought we could differentiate ourselves in research, and um, and the two go together, of course. Um, and what I thought we could do in research was differentiate ourselves on quality. There was a lot of places that did a lot of quantity of research, but when you really got down to it, you know there was questions about the quality of research and. The two ways that I thought that we would really differentiate ourselves in research was number one, to stay on focus to a, to a certain topic and just keep researching that topic till you, till you are experts in it and an authority on it and, and, and uh, have really a, a encompassing story to tell. That we were gonna make a meaningful difference in our research, not, it wasn't about padding the CV for, for personal gain, but it was to really make a meaningful difference in our field. 
And you can only do that by staying on topic. So we weren't going to do a research study on the cuff and then do one on instability and then do one on arthritis and then do one on frozen shoulder. We did a little bit of that, to be honest, but for the vast majority of what we did, we stayed focused on rotator cuff. And we thought we needed to look at it from all um, angles. We wanted to look at how do you evaluate a person with a rotator cuff problem? How do you decide when or not to operate? When you decide what is the best type of surgeries? What is the best type of salvage situations? What is the best follow-up of these things? How do you evaluate somebody with rotator cuff disease? There's all kinds of things you could study about a disease. You don't have to jump from one different uh, topic to another. If you stay on, the, on, on something, you will, you will make a much bigger difference to it. One of the things I used to say about building a research program is if you start with a quality emphasis, you can end up with both quality and quantity. But if you start with a quantity emphasis, you probably will never make it to quality because there's a certain amount of investment that's required to get there. So, so we decided we were going to focus on one area of shoulder surgery and try to own that area. And it ended up being the rotator cuff. I'll tell you why in just a second. The, the second thing we said was when we did research on that one area, we were going to have the highest standards possible in the research. So early on, I, I basically made it a, a decree that we were not going to start a research project unless we really truly thought that we could end up publishing in the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery, which was extremely tall order back in that day. Um, and, uh, and in fact, early on, we had years where we were publishing as many as five JBJS articles in one year uh, on shoulder. And, and it, it really became an achievable thing where, again, we were, were getting both quality and quantity because we started with quality first. Um, so I had actually started an interest in the natural history of rotator cuff disease as a resident. Uh, I had a very close friend. His name was Jerry Scher, uh, is Jerry Scher. He did a research study uh, on uh, people who had no shoulder problems at all and wanted to look at their MRIs to see how often was an MRI um, abnormal and people who had totally normal shoulders. So we did a, a study on that and looked at what was the glenohemal kinematic changes in people with asymptomatic shoulders. So I had a little bit of, um, of uh, experience with people with asymptomatic shoulders. Then I, when I went to Washington University, I had an incredibly good fortunate uh, uh, incident, a, a, a big stroke of luck. Uh, sometime in my first couple months there, I don't remember exactly when, it may even have been the first month I was at Wash U, I bumped into somebody in the elevator, um, a, a doctor in the elevator, and, and he looked at me and said, hey, aren't you Ken Yamaguchi, the new shoulders doctor? And I said, yes, I am. He goes, do you know that we do ultrasound here at Washington University for the rotator cuff? And I go, no, I didn't know that. And he goes, do you know much about ultrasound? And I said, I, I know absolutely nothing about ultrasound. And he, back then, nobody really knew about ultrasound except for University of Washington. And, um, and uh, it was not accepted at all, for sure, as an imaging modality. Everybody was still really learning about MRI. And um, he said, well, we can get really accurate pictures. Why don't you come down and check it out one day? And I said, oh, thank you. And uh, Luckily, uh, I actually followed up on that. Then the very next day, I, I went down to the ultrasound suite and I said, here I am. Uh, I'd love to see what you guys do. And he said, well, you want to look at your own rotator cuff? I took off my shirt and, and he just started imaging my cuff. And I was looking at really neat pictures. And I was like wondering, wow, can you really see this stuff? And then, uh, then he started looking at my opposite shoulder, uh, my left shoulder. and uh, and I asked him, do you routinely do um, uh, ultrasounds on both shoulders when somebody comes in complaining of pain on one side? And he goes, yes, we routinely do it because it's a relatively new imaging modality. And, um, and we want to know what normal looks like to compare with abnormal. And given my um, experience with uh, asymptomatic uh, cuffs as a resident, I asked him, well, 
do you sometimes see people with complete tears on the on the painless shoulder? And he goes, yeah, it's really interesting. We don't know what to think of that. And that's when kind of the light bulb uh, turned on in my head. And I said, wow, these people have uh, accidentally almost discovered a whole population of people with full thickness tears and no pain. And this was uh, an amazing opportunity to follow the natural history of rotator cuff disease. And that's kind of base, uh, kind of how we started the whole project. Uh, but talking about quality, you know, one of the things that people never do is they never really validate their measurement tools and stuff. They assume they're accurate. In our case, uh, we had ultrasound, which a lot of people had suspicions about. So we first started by really studying ultrasound and finding out exactly how accurate it is in all situations. Partial tears, complete tears, massive tears, uh, tears in people who had previous surgery, uh, and, and, and young people, old people, all uh, acute tears versus chronic tears. We studied it in all different conditions. I used to take a um, a, a measurement tool into the operating room, measure exactly what the dimensions were, the tears were arthroscopically, and then and then blindly uh, write the, write them down, and it'd be uh, compared to the readings on the ultrasound. We really analyzed the accuracy of the tool first, and then did our studies based on that tool. Uh, and uh, that's basically how we started. But I'd say my my again my um, my uh, teaching points there would be. Um, to try to make a difference and work on quality rather than quantity uh, and, and stay focused so that you can try to tell a story about with something in your research someday. There's so many aspects of the story that I think are fascinating. You know, the, you bump into someone in the elevator, you follow it up, then you realize that we have something unique here. Now, I know one of your next step was that once you validated your your measurement methodology and once once you had you know built that collaboration with doctors middleston and tfe that you then went to then apply for an nih grant and you've obtained multiple of these r01 grants since then and for our listeners these are there are very very few practicing orthopedic surgeons who obtain this type of grant as a principal investigator so tell us what led you to apply and how do you think it helped move the project in your research program forward to do that yeah Again, I got completely lucky, to be honest with you. Um, so I had gotten received the OREF grant for the Natural History of Rotator Cuff Disease. Uh, it was a three-year uh, grant, and uh, it was very productive. We got a lot done with this grant. And then I, I didn't know what else to do at that point. Uh, and so um, I looked into potentially getting an RO3 grant, which is another career development grant from the NIH. In all honesty, I had absolutely no designs on getting an R01. Didn't even think that was in the scope of possibilities. Uh, that was the stratosphere that you know, real real researchers, full time researchers play, and not not uh, people who are, you know, eighty percent clinical. And in fact, at the time, um, I believe the only other clinical, uh, only grant that was clinical by an active practicing orthopedic surgeon was by Jim Weinstein on the spine. It was called the Sport Grant. So there, there, there have been a precedent of only one major R01 clinically by, led by a PI who was clinical uh, prior to the uh, Natural History Grant. So, I mean, I, I really didn't have any reason to think I would ever be in the NIH R01 category. But Dr. Gelberman um, actually called me, uh, called me and said, I know somebody at the NIH and you ought to talk to him for advice about, about this R03 grant. And uh, so I called him up and, he's, and, uh, and I said, uh, uh, I, can you tell me about the R03 grant? And he said, well, you know, this is really competitive grant and blah, 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 blah. And I started, my heart started think, sinking, thinking, okay, I can't even get an R03 grant. And he said, what do you have? And I told him what I had uh, based on the OREF grant. And he said, well, you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be applying for an RO3 grant. <laughs> and, I, you know, again, my heart sank. And then he said, you should be applying for an RO1 grant. And I go, what? An RO1 grant? Are you kidding me? And uh, he goes, no, I think you got enough for an RO1 grant. And I said, what do you, you know, he said, what do you got to lose? And um, I was thinking. 
a whole heck of a lot of time, but but I did it anyways, and um, I, uh, I I applied, and I was shocked to get a a very competitive score on the first time, and they they actually had only one criticism, and that was that I didn't have a uh, epidemiologist statistician helping uh, to uh, to set up the um, uh, um, data analysis. And that was easy to fix. I just went to a statistician at at at, uh, at uh, Washington University and uh, uh, made him a co-author on the grant, asked him to write the stats section, which happened to be about two thirds of a page, and uh, then resubmitted the grant. And all all of a sudden, we got an extraordinary score on it. And then I was an R01 investigator. And uh, it was pretty interesting because the, the day I found out about it, I was staring at my computer and Dr. Gelman walked past my office and I said, Richard, take a look at this. And he looked at the at my screen and said, well, congratulations, you got an R01. And I, and, uh, and, uh, I, I was like going, I can't believe this. And then, then he kind of burst my bubble immediately and said, you know, Ken, the real test of whether you whether you're going to make a difference is if you can get two R ones, then you have sustaining research. <laughs> so from from the so from, so from the get go, I could, I basically got to enjoy my R one for about no, I don't know thirty seconds <laughs> before I had the pressure to think about the second one. Isn't that a nice reward once you get that amazing uh, amazing grant? Just the pressure to get the next one, uh, <laughs> but at least you got those thirty seconds, which is nice. Well, yeah. So, you know, I think for Pete and I, we, so much of what you've done has changed our practice. But from your perspective, what, what do you think have been the major findings of your work, especially with regard to the cuff? And how have those findings changed your practice? Well, you know, there's a, I think there's a lot of things that have come out of it. But if you were to summarize, one of the most important parts about it is that um, we we operate a lot thinking about the risk and the benefits of surgery. What we don't think enough about is what are the risks and the benefits of no surgery. And what, the reason why we don't think about it is because we don't know the natural history of many of the things that we take care of um, because we tend to intervene very, very quickly and early in, in the United States. And so... Um, one of the things the natural history study has taught us is that there are risks and benefits of non-operative treatment too. And the risks of non-operative treatment uh, are greater in young people with full thickness tears. Their tears tend to get larger, they become more chronic, and that there's a, you know, there is a time period when they're likely to heal. And after that, as they get older, they're not as likely to heal. And so there is a risk to non-operative treatment. Your tear can get larger and uh, you get older. Two things happen in, with time on a rotator cuff tear. One of them for sure, and one of them pro probably. For sure, you get older the longer you wait. And age is one of the most important factors on whether or not a tear will heal. And the second most important factor, or maybe equally important factor, is the size of the tear. And our studies have shown that these tears tend to get larger, significantly larger over time. So that's not as much of a risk when you're already on, on the older side and already have a large tear, but it is a pretty big risk when you're a younger person and have a small tear. And uh, I think that's, the, that's the, the main message of our research. Now tell us, I... I... You know, the, one of the, the things that I think has come out of that is not just that there's this risk, but because your research has been so careful and you followed these patients prospectively, we have numbers on the risks, um, which I find really helpful in my day-to-day -day conversations. And I, I, um, I think that's one of the greatest debts we owe to you is that we have these numbers about if you have a partial thickness tear in five years, what's the likelihood it will progress? If you have a full thickness tear in five years, this is the likelihood it progresses. And then even beyond that, I mean, you've studied every single detail of it, the migration, what leads to the migration, when, when the tear gets larger, which direction does it get larger in? One of the things that I think has been most interesting is just, just as almost a fallout from some, of the, from some of the original descriptions of the tears, we have some data on etiology. So tell us a little bit about that, about 
where the position and side of the tendon being damaged, how that led you to change the way you think about the etiology of rotator cuff tendon? Well, um, we had uh, 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 an amazing fellow that did research with us and then became a clinical fellow, Mike Kim. Uh, his uh, real name is Hyun Min Kim, but uh, I'm probably uh, pronouncing that incorrectly. But um, he did this one study um, that uh, showed that the, the, the more these, the, the tear uh, encompasses the anterior part of the supraspinatus, the more likely you are to get uh, fatty degeneration. And this made some sense because if you lose the anterior portion of supraspinatus, you, you, you lose also the anterior part of the rotator cable. But, but the dogma back then was that all tears start at the front of the supraspinatus and then migrate posteriorly. So, uh, you know, to say that that's a risk factor means that all tears have a risk factor. The only way his research made sense is if, is if tears didn't start at the front of the supraspinase, but maybe started posterior to that and then grew both anteriorly and posteriorly. So uh, we tested that hypothesis, uh, or more specifically, Mike did. He, he went back and looked at all of our ultrasound data, uh, you know, in total over the uh, 10 or greater than 10 years of the grant, we had over 300 people in the, in the study longitudinally uh, tested and and um, he had a he, he discovered a very clever way to 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 calculate where was the most likely place that tear started and they started about one and a half centimeters from the anterior edge of the supraspinatus and then uh, it appeared that they migrated anteriorly and posteriorly from this location and once we discovered that, a lot of things started to make sense. It made sense that you can migrate from that location anteriorly till you lose the cable and then you get fatty degeneration. The other thing is when we looked at glenohumeral kinematics, one and a half centimeters appeared to be a critical t size where you, then you started to see superior migration. We didn't know why, but then it all of a sudden made sense based on on uh, this tear location situation. And then there's been uh, historic data about the vascularity of the cuff that this area at one and a half centimeters uh, posterior to the biceps tendon was the area of, of watershed uh, vascularity. That was the, where there was the least amount of vascularity uh, to the cuff on the, on the um, uh, articular side. And you can see that on any arthroscopy. If you go in dry, you'll see vascularity going right up to the cable and being, and you'll see relative blanching in the area lateral to the cable there. And all this started to make sense both biologically from a vascular standpoint, from a biomechanical standpoint, and from from a uh, yeah, pathology standpoint, like fatty degeneration or thing. It was it was really some it was really neat research where all of a sudden other research started to then make a lot of sense based on the findings of this one study. Now. Um... You know, you, you did all this research work, and then I know part of the way through, you became interested in getting an MBA and did that through WashU, and now have recently kind of transitioned partly away from clinical medicine. Tell us what drove you to make this change, and what have you learned in the process? Well, uh, so um, I... Um... I was a, a deputy editor for Upper Extremity for JVJS, and that took a ginormous amount of time per week. And um, uh, it is one of those coveted positions in orthopedics. And uh, I'll, I'll be honest, I did not like it. Uh, I didn't like it from day one, um, and I hated to. Um, I hated to um, reject papers. I've done research my entire life, and I and I didn't like it when I got a rejection letter. And uh, I hated giving them out. Um, there were time I really respected the peer review, review process, and sometimes I would accept papers that I didn't really like that much, but all the reviewers did. And in any case, I was spending a lot of time doing something I didn't really enjoy that much, and and at the end of the day, I didn't feel like I was making a huge difference with. So I decided, look, I'm going to stop doing that and do something I really want to do and enjoy and um, decided to do the MBA instead. Um, and uh, people ask me 
um, over the years, why did I do an MBA or why was I going to do an MBA or why am I doing an MBA? And I always answered because I really was interested. I really wanted to learn about that area. And, um, and that was it. It was never for a specific purpose, uh, uh, career wise. It was, it was totally about learning. And, uh, uh, and so I did it and it was one of the most transformative things in my life. It was one of the more enjoyable experiences of my life. I just, it was just thrilling. I, I would look forward to every lecture, uh, with a passion and, uh, they warned me that I would do, be doing, uh, up to 20 hours a week, uh, for the MBA. And uh, the first half I was spending a good 30 hours a week. I was just doing more than the work that I needed to do because I just was so interested. Now, I made up for it in all honesty by probably averaging less than 10 hours a week for the second half of the MBA where I started cruising a little bit. But um, early on, I just loved it. And it really taught a lot about leadership and the, the, the difference you can make through management and other things. And, um, and you know, there, there's a close relationship between uh, mission and, and business, you know, otherwise termed m- no, no margin, no mission, no mission, no margin. And, uh, you know, I, I, through this education, I really could see that the, that, that there was a lot of opportunities in the management of people and the management of business that were not being realized on the medical side, uh, that was well known, uh, in the business side. And so I started to become more and more, um, interested in, in doing management positions. Um, I started to look at chairmanships uh, very seriously for the first time in my life and uh, had a couple of outstanding offers and was very close to taking an offer when another lucky thing happened. It may seem like I I get lucky a lot. And and I think the fact of the matter is I just did get lucky a lot. Um, And um, one day I, I was about to make a decision for a chairmanship somewhere and I got a call from Centene's uh, chairman and Centine, uh, he called me and said, Hey, Ken, I, I heard that you're leaving St. Louis and I, and leaving uh, Washington university. Is that true? And I said, well, I not for sure yet, but it's probably true. And he said, well, if you're going to leave Wash U, what about us? And I honestly didn't know much about Centene. They were one of the largest companies, uh, in Missouri. Uh, it is now the largest company in Missouri, and uh, but I knew that, and I knew they were in healthcare, but I didn't know anything else about them. I didn't know about managed care or anything else. And um, he said, "Can we um, can we just have a, a a breakfast to discuss it?" And uh, so I met him for a, a breakfast meeting, and uh, at the beginning of the meeting, I said, "Look." Uh, uh, I thought about it, and I just want to let you know at the beginning that I have two guardrail issues that where there's you know pretty much no way I can consider this opportunity. Uh, I really appreciate you you thinking about me, but these are pretty important issues. And he goes, and he said, "Well, what what are they?" And I said, um, "Well, um, number one, I can't stop being a doctor." He said. I said, I know for sure, no matter what success I ever get in any other uh, situation, I'll never be as good as what I can be with my hands in the operating room. I I can't stop doing that. It's a calling for me. And he said, I don't want you to stop being a doctor. In fact, your reputation as a doctor is one of the most important aspects of this job. We want to make sure that our medical leader has credibility as somebody who cares about the welfare of their patients and members. Uh, And he said, exactly how much do you want to practice? Because I think we can make it happen. And I said, well, if you're looking at major chairmanships, you're generally uh, about 70% uh, administrative and 30% clinical. So I would want to be able to operate once a week and see patients at least half a day a week, maybe a little bit more. And he, and, he, and he took about a nanosecond to say, done, no problem. In fact, we con- want you to continue uh, speaking, continue doing research. We'll, make, we'll support all of that. Nurses, whatever, will support all of that. And so I'm like, going, wow, okay. 
And then uh, he said, what's your second issue? And I said, well, if I come to Centene, I don't want to just be pigeonholed as the doctor. I, I want to be learning about all aspects of the, of the business and have a seat at the table and, and uh, really uh, be able to, to make sure that medical issues are understood in the context of all business decisions. And uh, he said, well, that's exactly why we want you. He said, we want you for your strategic input and we want medicine at the table. He said, he said uh, um, in the past, the chief medical officer position was an SVP, senior vice president position. And uh, for you, we will elevate it to an executive VP. He said, there's only a couple people like that in the, in the company. You'll be a partner in the company. And uh, and uh, we have a board meeting every Friday and discuss everything, including national, international expansion, everything. Is that good enough for you? And I'm like going, well, gosh, I don't know what else to talk about. Then. And and uh, but, you know, it was it was interesting. He said um, he said, you know, how many people do you see in clinic a year? How many people do you operate on, on a year? And how many people do you think you reach through your research? And, you know, I think if you counted it all up, you could maybe get to 100,000 people. Uh, he said, well, how would you like to be the last word on medical treatment for about, uh, I, I don't remember the number, I think it was about 12 million people. And that number, by the way, is about 26, 27 million people today. And he said, I, he said, I really think you'll, you'll be able to make a bigger difference in this job than you had in your previous job. And that, to me, kind of um, uh, solidified my decision. But that's how it happened. I, I felt like I was walking down the street one day and saw a little piece of paper and picked it up and it happened to be the winning lottery ticket. I mean, I was not looking for the job, uh, didn't know it existed, and just got a phone call out of the blue. You may not remember this, but you and I had a um, really interesting conversation when I was a fellow where you talked about your role at Centene and, you know, insurance companies in general and managed care and how we as surgeons, you know, we, we think that we're the one that has the patient's best interest at heart. But if you look financially, we don't necessarily, I mean, we are incentivized to do more, you know, and that the patient doesn't necessarily have all the information to make the decisions. And so in some ways, how managed care has, you know, the, the best incentives to both align the patient's health as well as to reduce cost. And I think that's probably not the way that many surgeons see it. I think many surgeons see the insurance company as their enemy. Tell, tell me a little more. Do you think there's a role for more surgeons on the insurance side? Is this something that more surgeons should be looking into as a way that we can contribute more to our patient's care? Tell me your thoughts here. Well, um, it, you know, I, I actually uh, mentor a lot of people um, uh, about this and uh, I formally mentor that is with regular meetings and everything. And, uh, um, I, I'll tell you that the business side really needs more clinicians, but what we don't need are just people with MDs, with MBA. We need people that really know how to take care of people, of patients, members, and really are mission-oriented, not business-oriented, participating in business decisions. Um, on the payer side, fundamentally what happens is that you get a certain amount of uh, money, premium revenue, to take care of a population of people. If you can take care of the people in less than that money, then you get a, a profit. If, you, if it takes more than that amount of money to take care of the people, then you will not make money. And so it is in the best interest of the payer to have the healthiest populations possible. Um, so let's put it from a, from a business perspective, from a standpoint of payment. If somebody needs a surgery and you as a payer or insurance company decide not to pay for it, that's really bad business. I'll tell you why. If you decide not to pay for a, a surgery that is needed, then the need for the surgery doesn't go away just because you decide not to pay for it. What happens generally is that the need becomes more and more severe over time. It becomes harder to treat over time and the outcomes start to suffer over time. 
Heck, my research on the natural history is all about that. And so it is in the best interest of the insurance company to make sure that people get all of the surgeries, let's just say, treatment, medications, whatever that they need, nothing more than they need, but nothing less, and probably erring towards a little bit more than they need. On the other hand, most providers, not all, but many of the providers are mostly fee for service. So uh, the incentives are basically the more you do, whether they need it or not, the more you get paid. And there's not a consequence to, to not doing more than you need to do. We have our ethics that keep most of us in line, but the bias is, is there and the bias really is shown in the numbers. Currently, about 30% of all healthcare dollars don't provide any specific uh, value to the patient. And uh, at, at least two thirds of that waste is, is, can be traced to entrepreneurial activity. So that's what I meant about the incentive structure. That's not a general statement on everybody's uh, actions, but it is talks about biases and what you can predict as a, as a, as, as a general rule for providers. And so more and more, I think we're getting t closer towards a value-based and, and shared risk arrangements where I think payers and pro providers will actually be in partnership. And, and the more people can be trained on that and how to give input to, to uh, payers, the better. Payers want to make our populations more healthy. It's better business for them to do that. So anybody who can give them better advice on that, it has certain significant value. Certainly, I think we're all excited for that future. So the last thing I want to talk about is you, you've you you had a busy clinical practice. You've obviously accomplished a lot from a research perspective. You have this role at Centene. You talked about all the time you voted to your MBA. You also have two children that are now college grads. And I think one of the biggest struggles in the life of a busy surgeon is how you balance your family, your obligations at work. And you've achieved a lot and you have these two children and a lot of our Younger listeners, I know, struggle with this balance. How did you make this balance work? What advice do you have in that regard? I um, I don't think I'm a good expert at that. Um, what I'll tell you for my life was that I did not have balance early in my career. I was devoted to the career to an excessive amount. I worked a huge amount of hours. Um, and, um, and that may have had a cost, uh, may not have. Uh, but to, to my credit, on the other hand, when, uh, because I worked so hard early in my career, it gave me the power to call my shots later. And uh, I'll tell you a, a, a story uh, that, that I relate a lot, probably a little bit inaccurately and probably enamored a little bit, but I'll tell you the fundamentals are totally true, was uh, my son, when he turned um, uh, five years old, was going to enter Little League, and I'm a baseball fanatic, and he was starting to go into Little League, and I was at dinner with Lisa Gallitz, and uh, I, I, I lament, lamented, God, I wish I could be like other parents and, uh, and go to my son's practices and participate in his baseball. And I thought she was going to throw her plate at me. She, she, her eyes got large, and she got angry at me, and Lisa said, what are you talking about? You wish you could. It's your choice. She said, you're at a place in your career where you can do what you want to do. You're not going to, if you're not going to be there for your son's baseball games, then you made that choice. And uh, man, it really hit me hard. I went back and I told my assistant, I'm going to be a, a coach in my, in my son's baseball team. And our practices are this time, and it's in my schedule, and nothing displaces it short of an emergency, a, a medical emergency. And um, I did. I was his coach all the way up through his select teams in baseball. He became a very serious baseball player, and it's something I really treasured. Similarly, my my daughter had different interests, but I I, I put things in the schedule to make sure that I was there for her. Uh, have very, very close relationships with my uh, kids. And uh, my son is now, for some crazy reason, in healthcare management. And uh, I probably talk to them on a daily basis still, even though they, um, they are not living with me. And uh, it's, I, I, I uh, credit Lisa Gallitz with uh, 
making me uh, make sure I have my priorities straight. But I, I see a lot of people work super hard early and then they keep working later when they can call their own shots because they just don't know any other way. And I guess my only take home lesson would be, look, if you work really hard early, the great thing about it is that it will provide you the opportunities to not work as hard and balance things later. But if you never work hard in the beginning, you probably are just going to be stuck in that kind of um, no man's land uh, in, in between where you're going to be compelled to keep working, working, working to make it, make a living and stuff and be controlled by your work more than you being able to control your work. So that's the advice I give younger people. Uh, if you're going to work hard, you can work hard early and, uh, and uh, hopefully call your shots later. Definitely some good life lessons for all of us, young listeners, old listeners, and everyone in between. One question Pete and I like to ask um, our, our guests who are giants of the field, as you are, is uh, the following. If you could have dinner with any person from history at any point, um, dead or alive, who would it be and where would you have dinner? <laughs> well, I know for sure where it would be. It would be at Sushi Na's in New York City, the number one sushi restaurant in, in the world, in my opinion. It's it's just extraordinary. Um, who, you know, I, I, I would have answered that question uh, very early on as uh, Al Albert Einstein, uh, just because he thought outside the box so much his imagination was just as extraordinary as his intelligence. But uh, I would say now it would be Abraham Lincoln, who to me was just the epitome of leadership and and uh, bringing people, even enemies, together and uh, achieving much greater than anybody ever would have thought because he had an ability to connect with people and uh, and lead people. Um, you know, uh, when he, when he died, uh, one of one of his um, people who was an enemy at the beginning of his administration, Stanton said, there lies the greatest leader of uh, men that, uh, you know, there was uh, not PC terminology back then, but uh, the greatest leader of men the world has ever known. And so uh, I admire people who have had extraordinary leadership uh, abilities. And I, I guess uh, that would be the person. I'd, I'd like to make one uh, final comment too uh, at the end, if I can, if I could have a chance. Please Absolutely. make your comment. Let's hear it. Yeah. Well, um, you know, I, uh, you talk a little bit about my research and stuff like that. And I, I will tell you the thing that, that really gives me the most satisfaction when I think about my career is, uh, is people like you, Peter. Um, uh, I, when, when we started our fellowship, we said uh, again we were going to try we were going to develop the number one educational program in the country and we said we were going to um, measure ourselves by what our fellows do after fellowship not during fellowship we were not so impressed if somebody said they're going to be a great fellow for you write a bunch of papers for you or take great care of your patients we were really interested in, is this person going to make a difference after fellowship is this person really going to advance the field? Is, is this person going to be somebody we're going to look at after and say, wow, we're so proud they're alumni of Bosch U. And um, uh, that's what really I feel like academic uh, life is all about. And seeing people just really make make a difference later, like you, Peter, and 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 uh, your senior person, Bob Tangent there at Utah. And, and numerous other graduates from Wash U all over the country in shoulder and elbow is, is what really, uh, it's really been given me the greatest satisfaction. And so uh, I gotta tell you, uh, uh, thank you for, for really uh, uh, realizing your potential and uh, making us proud. Well, I was um, extremely fortunate to receive the training I received. I, I tell my current fellows and trainees, the same thing I see, you know, you're, I was so lucky to be where I was when I was and to have the opportunity I was given and um, to have the, you know, to have the mentors that I had. And you mentioned it from the beginning, how important it is that, you know, you learn from people that are great. And I, I would never be where I am now without you. So I'm, I, I'm appreciative for everything you, you, you did for me. I will tell you, 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 you told me something at the end of fellowship that, um, 
that I, I tell my current fellows, because I think it's probably the best advice, which is, you know, I, I, um, at the very end, I, you said, oh, I, I said, you know, thank you so much for teaching me. And I'm, um, I'm nervous about next year, but I'm so glad for everything you've taught me. And you said, well, just wait for next year. It's the best fellowship you'll ever get. <laughs> and I tell my trainees that I say, I think you're learning a lot this year, but just wait till next year. Yeah, we, we say in our fellowship, we, we don't we don't want you to just memorize what we do. We want we want to train you by teaching you how to think so that that after fellowship, you're prepared for everything. Everything you learn during fellowship gets out of date in no time. So learning learning exactly how Dr. Yamaguchi or Keener or Chamberlain or anybody did something, uh, Gallus did something. Uh, would have a limited lifespan learning how to think and going and taking your own experiences and making them your own um, for your patients that to me was is the essence of training and uh, and uh, what really really brings the best fulfillment to my life i'll say also from a business standpoint and rachel you're welcome to come and do a fellowship with us someday <laughs> well, I was, i'm gonna say i feel like I, I have all the feels right now and i feel as though i need to uh need to pack up and do a second fellowship and so please look forward to my application <laughs> i'll get i'll try to have peter write a letter of rec if that's okay <laughs> uh, I, I have limited influence the, the, these days but i'll I, i'll i'll do my best um <laughs> in, in any case um you know one other one other just a uh, quick point is that um People ask me, uh, did you enjoy um, Centene? And, you know, I was there when it was a, uh, I started when it was a $20 billion company, and now it's a $130 billion company, the third largest payer in the country. And, and it was an incredible ride. And I just say it was a great job and a great experience. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll tell them. But you know what the difference was is that I worked uh, – almost 20 years now, I guess maybe 18 years as an orthopedic surgeon before coming to Centene. And I worked ginormous hours and I worked super hard and I never felt like I was working. And I never felt like that was a job. It was really a passion. And that was the difference between being a doctor and being a business person. You can make a great difference either way, but to me, being a doctor was a passion and is a passion. I will uh, retire from Centeen in the very near future, um, uh, but I don't want to retire as a doctor till somebody kicks me out of the operating room. <laughs> um, and um, and it's interesting in the business world. I see that uh, it, in the C-suite in um, uh, at Centeen, there's 14 offices, and now after seven years there, there's only two people that remain since from when I started there, and I'm one of them. And so people people don't last long, when, and they they move on because it's it's a job. It's a great job. Uh, whereas you know, how many people retire early from being a doctor? Almost nobody, right? Um, so um, uh, it's a privilege to take care of people, and uh, and it is amazing. It's an amazing way to make a living, and I think everybody should always keep that in mind and appreciate it because I did not appreciate it enough or as much as I should have. Uh, and it's only when I saw the other side, when I realized how, how, how great it is to be a doctor. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Those, I mean, I don't think we could finish on any better words than that. Certainly words to live by. Um, it, it really, I mean, in my early career, and I think Pete would echo the same, it really is a privilege to take care of patients and to, to just get to see how they do, you know, even when they don't do as well as you'd like and seeing them that work toward it and whatnot um, and using the training that you've had and, and hopefully making a difference. So thank you so much for, um, get, you know, spending the last hour with us and with all of our listeners and for everything you've contributed to um, the field. Um, certainly your contributions are going to live on for patients for generations to come. And Pete and I and all of our patients are so appreciative to you. And for that, that's all the time we have for this podcast. We want to thank our guest so much again for joining us. And for all of our shoulder and elbow listeners out there, please don't forget to subscribe. And for Pete Chalmers, I'm Rachel Frank, and we'll see you next time.